Welcome back to another episode of Rider Support. This week, we're going to talk about common training mistakes that almost everybody makes past the age of 40. We're going to talk about strategies for recovering from a high volume training block and finally a chain loop that is environmentally friendly. Excited to get into it. Sarah, how have you been? I've been great. Will we crack straight into these questions? Let's There's get loads it. to get through. I'm eager. You're eager. Okay, this question is from Neil. And I think this is going to resonate with a lot of people. Anthony, I'm new to cycling and fitness and found your podcast a few months ago. And I loved the one Faster After 40 with Joe Friel. Over the last year, I've kind of realized that my lifestyle was so unhealthy, both physically and mentally. And I've now quit smoking and drinking, etc. Etc. Et Sniff and glue as well. <laughs> Don't give all the good stuff up. I guess I've always been kind of skinny fat, so I've never been very big. But my question is, can I rewind back the clock a little? Am I doomed to have long-term health effects when I'm 70 because of my bad lifestyle up until now? I've just turned 47. I think you can rewind back the clock. This is a topic I've been exploring a lot in conversations in the podcast recently since I turned 40. This is something I've started thinking about. What what does my health look like when I'm 50, when I'm 60? What's my health look like in the last decade of my life? Because you can start forecasting based on your current health now what activities you will and won't be able to do when you're that age. And it gets pretty scary. Like if you want to be able to carry a suitcase down the stairs when you're age 70, you need a lot of strength when you're 40 or 47 as Neil is right now. So you need to start building that strength now. The good news is you definitely can build strength faster than your yearly decline as you age. You can add up VO2 max up past your 60s. You know, you can have a positive yearly effect. It's going to more than offset the natural diminishing effects of time. So I would say you can get going. This is something that I'm putting a lot of focus on. I've started working back, working one-on-one with some clients again recently, but not just cycling anymore because I've realized that cycling alone doesn't get you these health outcomes. Most of us, yeah, we love cycling. That's what unites this whole community. And, you know, that's why we're having the crack on X and this podcast and over in the Discord group. But it's really only a piece of the puzzle. You need to be doing, the data is so conclusive now. You need to be doing mobility work. You need to be moving a lot. Like maybe the worst piece of cycling advice in history is Sean Kelly when he said, never stand if you can sit, never sit if you can lie down. And if you lie down, always go asleep. Like knowing what we know now about the links between chronic disease and step count, that's pretty shocking. Yeah, I mean, that is so archaic. And I think Neil is quite lucky coming, reaching, you know, into his 40s and mid 40s now, where we have such a wealth of studies and knowledge. Sometimes it can be a little bit confusing, actually, because you're kind of bombarded with a lot of knowledge and, you know, information online in papers and trying to find what actually works for you. But I think you're right. There is like fundamental things that we should all be doing as we age in order for us to have a really good quality of life as we get into our older age. So it's not just like, you know, we're able to go and do really long sportif. It's when we're 70, we're still able to get out and about, be active, go hiking, pick up the grandkids, that kind of stuff. And now is definitely the time to start looking at that, isn't it? Yeah, the mistake I see almost everybody making is they become an athlete couch potato. So they start saying, oh, I'm going to take up cycling, or maybe you're cycling for years and you still fall into this category. You ride the bike, maybe you ride it even quite a lot, like you ride it 8, 9, 10, 15 hours a week. But when you're not on the bike, you're totally sedentary. And I know I fell into that trap for years years and I'd look at my weekly training volume I'm like okay I'm still carrying a bit of weight but I'm training 15 hours a week how is it possible to train more than this with my lifestyle and I just thought you know what carrying weight is a natural consequence of getting older being weak is a natural consequence of getting older but none of these things are true it's just training incorrectly and solely focused on one sport is just not the way to achieve long-term health. 
Rob Men, I know how serious you take your goal setting, whether they're fitness or life-related goals. If you're looking for a powerful ally to support you on this journey, look no further than Huel. Huel has become my secret weapon for when I don't have time to prepare a balanced meal. It ensures I get the nutrition I need without sacrificing time or taste. Plus, it stops me from reaching for that takeaway menu. I always throw a bottle into my backpack when I'm heading into the city to work and it stops me eating junk convenience foods, snacking on croissants and bars of chocolate because I know they don't support my training goals. It's a handy nutritious meal on the go and it's got over 22 grams of protein. Huel is perfect for athletes that don't have time to cook or prepare food before a training session. It's convenient, nutritious fuel at your fingertips, ensuring you hit your daily fueling needs for that session. Huel Ready to Drink has 26 essential vitamins and minerals in every single bottle. You're getting a whopping 175 health benefits. Plus, it's made from natural ingredients like tapika, sunflower seed, coconut, and more. The best part? It's the flavors. There's eight crazy, beautiful flavors. Iced coffee is what's in my backpack right at the moment. You can get Huel directly to your home. All you got to do is head on over to the Huel website, huel.com forward slash roadman. Yeah, I agree. Neil, my advice to you is get yourself a couple of dogs. That's been (laughs) probably the biggest game changer for me insofar as I got a couple of dogs and I took on this responsibility I Bruce and, wants to go out. Bruce wants to go out and Bruce gets to go. If he he's looking at me with those big brown eyes and I get a lot of steps in. For me, I think that's like one of the biggest hacks. If you can get a dog, if you're in a position to get a dog, they're brilliant for keeping you active beyond the bike. Do you have any other advice for Neil? Get a second dog. <laughs> Okay, question number two, and this is from Claire. This is a cycling etiquette question here, Anthony and Sarah. A guy on my Saturday group spin is so aggressive towards motorists and other slower riders, like people out for a leisure spin on the bike path. I grimaced a few weeks ago when you covered if runners should be allowed to run on the bike path because I've seen him literally roar at the top of his lungs at any non-cyclist on the bike lane. It's actually putting me off going on the group ride, even though this spin has kind of become my only social outlet. Any advice? As a female member of the group, I don't feel confident to address this. There are, of course, rumblings and eye rolls from other people in the group, but no one has actually come out and said anything to this guy. It does go to underline the point so often, especially on this podcast, that we have focused on the interaction between cars and cyclists. And I think that paints over a larger problem that there's good drivers, there's bad drivers, there's good cyclists, there's bad cyclists. There's some that are just arseholes in every walk of life. And this sounds like one of those. It's everyone has a bad day. And if it's an isolated event, you know, I've snapped at motors, I've snapped at pedestrians, but I don't snap at pedestrians every single time I see a pedestrian. I don't snap at a motorist every time I see a motorist. If it's habitual, it becomes a bit of a problem. And Sounds I, like this guy is going out looking for an issue. If you look for trouble, you find it. Like, yeah, absolutely. It sounds like he's going out to try and find a fight. Do you ever have those days day? when you're like, you go out and maybe you haven't because you're quite a genteel person. <laughs> but do you ever have those days <laughs> where you're going out and you're in a bad mood and you're almost waiting for someone to close past you so you can react yeah. Like I've had those very infrequently, but mm. if you do go out looking for trouble, it does have a way of finding you. And people yeah. like this always seem to find trouble. Yeah, I agree. It's hard to know really what the advice is here for this girl. Claire, as a lot of the time, I'm the only girl in the cycling group that we go out on a Saturday. And to be honest, I've been kind of lucky because I have Anthony there. You know, if somebody is being quite aggressive or if I'm not comfortable with something, or even if it's that something like someone's, you know, I feel like not safe riding beside them or something. I can kind of say to Anthony, he can advise me on it. And I know that if I was the only female and I didn't have that kind of support and someone like this was kind of going off and making me feel uncomfortable, likelihood would be that I would find another group. And that's really, really sad because we should definitely be able to, you know, voice what we're doing. If this person is kind of aggressive with motorists and somebody who steps onto the bike path, I don't think I would feel comfortable saying it to them. It's got to be the group leader though or the the club chairman or whatever that structure and is. therein lies the problem with a lot of groups is that you do need somebody to really go and spearhead the ride and take responsibility for being 
the ride leader. And that's what I would say, Claire, is to put a suggestion into the WhatsApp group, something like that to say, look, can we get a, you know, a responsible person, somebody who's willing to take kind of the lead on these rides, routes, safety, all of that kind of stuff. Don't worry, a lot of people will love that. They will relish the road. Um, hopefully this guy doesn't offer to do it. And then I think it, the subject needs to be broached with the person who is leading the group that something has to be said. But this is, I'm not sure if you remember when we were setting up Roadman at the very start, the most senior member of the club, Sean Lally Senior, I think he's 84 at the moment. He's been in so many clubs. He yeah. gave me one piece of advice on it. He's like, don't set up a committee. He's like, clubs fall apart by committee. He's like, this club has got to be a dictatorship. Yeah. yeah. Dictatorships work in it. Like, that's an easy one if that happens on our group, right? Mm-hmm. I just tell that person, go home. You're not welcome. Here. Yeah, you're not welcome. Exactly. So, yeah, I agree. It's definitely one as a dictatorship. Or as, as I know that, like, not all groups are, you know, you can't kind of rewind time. But yeah, I wish in situations like this, other people would step up because it's obviously, maybe it's not as annoying to the other riders as it is for this lady or she feels a little bit more kind of uncomfortable than the guys or other women in the group. But this just shouldn't be happening on a group ride. Next up. Okay, this is from Stephen L. Anthony, how have you been after Ross Moon? Now, I'm not comparing the two, but I'm doing a five-day cycling holiday that will really push me to my limits. I think I'm pretty much prepared for the trip and my legs feel strong, but what can I start doing now in the two weeks leading up to it that will help me recover and manage my fatigue on the other side and not pick up a flu or a bug? So how are you? Do you want to talk a little bit about I'm how you're wrecked. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm wrecked. What's now two weeks ago? No, I'm back. I took the first week after it pretty easy. Just walked a little bit, rode the bike a couple of times, mainly to mentally recharge because it's four yeah. days and I don't know how many kilometers, you know, long was it? Like 120 a day. Yeah. So. And I can also, Ross Moon is, so it's down in a particularly beautiful part of Ireland. It's held all around County Kerry, which is probably the most the most stunning area in Ireland, I think. But this is for like young fellas, like light young fellas. That's already for young fellas. It's for it's for elites regardless of your age. Elites. It's not yeah, for... absolutely. But anyway, Anthony, you, you did amazing. I <laughs> did absolutely amazing. And yeah, I think your recovery has been quite good. There hasn't been too much bitching and moaning since you got home. There hasn't been, I haven't been wait, waiting on your hand and foot, but you are quite careful and quite particular about the couple, not only two weeks before a big race like that, you're quite particular a good few weeks out. Yeah, I don't know if there's much you can do in terms of preparation for not getting sick or injured before the event in the two weeks before it because most of that goes to have you built enough training volume that this isn't a huge overstretch for you because if you overstretch too much then you run into problems with your immune system you run into problems with injury so I don't think there's too much you can do in the two weeks before it because you want to start your taper about a week before probably so that's kind of an awkward time. Most of that groundwork gets laid months out. But I think in the few days after, you can definitely do a few bits to make yourself a little bit more robust. The, the two things I really think about in the week after a stage race are inflammation and immune function. And inflammation, I'll try and get down to the sea and do a couple of cold plunges. Also, omega trees they are massively linked to reducing muscle inflammation potentially leading to faster recovery and less muscle soreness. So they're worth doing, but they are double whammied as well because they affect the activity of white blood cells called B cells. And that's going to enhance your body's ability to fight infection. So that's always something that was nailed into me after stage races. It's omega-3s, vitamin vitamin C, plenty of hydration, cold therapy, and just it sounds common sense, but if your immune system is suppressed, you don't want to be around sick people. So you need to be a little bit protective of yourself. Put yourself in a little bit of a bubble where the usual environments may be around school kids or if you're picking kids up from the nursery, if you've young kids or whatever, or trains, public transport, they're not going to be brilliant environments for you. Your immune system's already rock bottom. So if you can put yourself in a little bit of a COVID bubble for the week after it, 
that's normally going to help you. Because the thing is, you want to get a benefit from those blocks, whether it's racing or a training block. You want to get a benefit. So the hard training actually doesn't make any faster or stronger. It gives the potential to get faster or stronger when coupled with recovery. So if you don't recover properly, you actually never get the adaptation. So you may as well not have went and done the stage race or the training block in the first place. Kind of how I feel what that happened to me after we came home from Girona the last time after we did the Santaval gravel race. I got so many kilometers in the legs over there and the race I found particularly hard. And then I stayed training the following week. And when I came home, I had my motivation was on the floor. I was wrecked. I just couldn't get going. Um, so I know that you're saying you have the legs as well, but like make sure you're getting sleep. Try and stay away from alcohol. Make sure you're eating properly. All of those things will really stand to you when you come back as well. See, overreaching is the problem. That's probably what happened to you yes, at Santa Valle. Definitely. It's like you haven't got enough volume built up before it. Actually, this was interesting. We created a clip on our YouTube Clips channel about Jay Vine talking about why Pogaccia fell apart in last year's Tour de France. And what he was talking about was the volume of training that he'd built up with his wrist injury last year was insufficient to carry him through three weeks of the Tour if all three weeks were hard. So for the first two weeks, Jumbo Visma rode hard, just trying to generate a lot of kilojoules per day to put a lot of load on Pogaccia's body not to attack him that day, but to give this cumulative... Just to wear him down. Exactly. So yeah. when he got into the third week, when it was time to finally attack, he was already on his hands and knees. And then the famous, I'm done, I'm done, go without me. That's crazy. I'm going to put a link to that. I have to say, I love how honest Jay Fong is. You can just imagine them in the UAE meetings be, before the tour being like, okay, how are we going to get Bugatti here? We know he hasn't trained. We know he's undertrained. He only has X amount of weeks. There's no way possible he can be coming in. And we are going to chip away at him. It's so amazing. So I'm going to link that particular link in the show notes. So everyone go and check that out. Okay, next question. And this is from dfits 13 Should I encourage my girlfriend into cycling? She is fit and currently does a lot of running, but has shown a big interest in coming out with me on some rides and is looking at buying a road bike. Obviously, I'm not saying that I could stop her. I'm definitely not the boss. But knowing that Sarah followed you into the sport and considering how dangerous it can be, what would your advice be? And I guess to broaden it, would you recommend cycling to a person looking for a new sport? Up until this year, the answer would have been, I probably wouldn't have even answered this question. We would have just reviewed a post show and said, oh, that's it. pointless. Made the cut. But yeah. I'm actually not sure. And maybe that's just proximity to a lot of carnage recently on the roads for me. Ireland, for me, is one of the worst places in the world to ride a bike right now. The amount of close passes that you get every single time you go out on the bike, it's absolutely chronic. And these are not imagined. We've had a lot of Well, you've come from spins crying across, in the last uh, yeah. six Un- months. Unlike the, you know, the person in the group that we just spoke about a couple of questions ago, I'm more of a crier. So I'll kind of come home and have a very ugly cry about how scary the whole thing is. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I've had some shocking close passes as well. A good friend of ours that we went to Girona with yeah, got hit uh, from behind with a car out training like only two, three weeks ago. Thankfully, he's okay. Someone else died. The roads are carnage at the moment. I would still say, yes, the bike has given me, you know, so much from this podcast and meeting amazing friends, experiences yeah. traveling the world. But depending on where they are, I think I would maybe recommend mountain biking, gravel cycling, or even indoor cycling. But I don't think indoor cycling can be a means itself because let's be honest, it's a bit boring. Like even with the advent, like with the advancements in tech, you know, indoor bikes are brilliant at the moment, but it's still not outdoor cycling. You don't have that connection. So I would say yes, but depending on where you are, maybe think about an alternate to road cycling. Yeah, and what I will say as somebody who's come into the sport later and fo- and followed Anthony, who's very good at cycling, is to get her potentially into a group, but definitely cycling with people who have a lot of experience. So tell her, as we say, to watch the good lads. Tell her not to just go out you know, on her own without having any kind of bike handling experience, take responsibility for, you know, the things that she can change, the things that she can learn. That is is very, very important. 
It's such a brilliant sport. Like I would encourage anybody into it. Again, as Anthony says, depending on the location, D Fitz sounds like a pretty Irish name. Because <laughs> he's from South Dublin. <laughs> A group is like the main thing, I think. If yeah, you can get I into agree. a group, you're much safer in a group than you are out trying on your and own you'll or one so friend. you'll learn so much. Yeah. You'll learn so much. Get into it, but do it with a group. Yeah. Okay. Question number six. Hey guys, I've been watching your YouTube channel and after watching the episode with the Silka founder, I was wondering if I should be waxing my chain and not using regular lube. You guys really don't go into too much detail on the pros and cons of wax. I love talking about lube on this show. Wet lube or dry lube or wax, Anthony, what do you think? This is all, honestly, this is all like gobbledygook to me. I, we have, we're, we're in an apartment and God love our neighbours, they probably hate us. As we go out the front door, we've got a little, we've got four or five bottles of concoctions and whatever kind of comes to my hand first, I throw in my chain and that's kind of what I go with. And that is not a very good sign because I know I'm losing watts. So what do you think, Anthony? Wax, lube? My Woosh is hands down the best virtual cycling app for home and it's redefining indoor training at no cost. Yep, it's absolutely free. And setting up My Woosh is really easy. Just download the My Woosh app, connect your device like your Watt bike or your smart trainer and off you go. Now, if you're feeling competitive, there's weekly races for every category from beginner to pro, Plus, there's insane prize money up for grabs. Now, if you've no plan to race, that's no problem. There's hundreds of free training plans and workouts that are designed to really push you to your limits. You can enjoy daily group rides and group workouts and you can customize your avatar all without opening your wallet. So go on over to the MyWish app and have a look around. Why spend money on monthly subscriptions elsewhere when MyWish offers all of this for free. So join my wish today. It's available on iOS, Mac OS, Google Play, Apple TV, or click on the link in the show notes to get started. I suppose it depends on the level of cyclist that someone is. If they're trying to optimize for performance, they're a track cyclist, seconds matter. Wax is going to give you more drivetrain efficiency. There's a podcast which if you search our youtube channel with josh portner from silka and he talks about the actual gains dylan johnson was on as well talking about the actual gains of using a waxed chain over an oil-based chain i will link that as well because it's so good and uh, mind-boggling how long people can talk about wax chain wax and wax chain loops and stuff so fascinating but it's like it's like the you know that joke like how do you know somebody's done an iron man oh because they tell you they've done an iron man <laughs> It's kind of like that. How do you know someone's waxed their chain? Because they're going to tell you straight away. Like once someone <laughs> waxed their chain, they never seem to go back. Now, it's a pain in the ass is the thing. You yeah, gotta, it's not very user friendly. Is no, it? you've got to take your chain. We get pictures in the group riding in the Discord of people waxing their chains and drawing them on clotheslines. you got to be able to take your chain off. you got to know how to put it back on. you got to have this wax cooker to put it into. It so, looks like it's, it's basically a slow cooker. It's a crock pot, yeah. Yeah, a crock pot. And exactly. You get the wax, you drip it into that, but it's a process. It really is a process. Is it worth it for me? No, it's not worth it. You're looking at margins here. Something that I have started paying more attention to is toxins and traditional chain lubes and some of the waxes, I think maybe all the waxes, I haven't researched it that much because I don't use them too much. They're just packed full of toxins that are very, very difficult to remove from the environment. They're really bad stuff and there is one company that I've been looking at and I've ordered a bunch of their stuff called Mountain Flow Bike Lube which makes environmentally friendly chain lube for me that's much more of a consideration can I avoid these treacherous toxins than 1% gains in drivetrain efficiency yeah and it's not that you're going to be you know exposed to these toxins really when you're putting it on your chain well you are but it's going down into the water table. It's getting into the food. You see people with like all over their hands, their chain comes off yeah. and it's like, you know, you do get a lot of exposure to it as yeah, well. Yeah, that's very true. That is very and true. And you're cleaning it off at some point as well. Yeah. So I yeah. think you get more exposure to it than you than think you, th- you than do. You considering how toxic it is. Mm. So for this guy, you're kind of, if... Don't bother, wax. Don't bother. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Folks, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Rider Support. 
If you have questions for us, you can reach myself and Sarah over on X or in the Discord group, which is kind of the hub of the community that's linked below. If you enjoyed this, there's another video up here, which I know you're going to love. And please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and share it into the Club WhatsApp group. Until next week.